take our Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 14. And you might be wondering, well, we, last time we did Joshua chapter 11, and now down to Joshua chapter 14, how come? Well, if you look at the chapters 12 and 13 and 14, I think you'll see why I'm skipping over these. Mostly it's just just names. Jay, that would have been a good one for you to read from <laughs> Uh, a whole list of names here we see in chapter uh, tw chapter 12 and uh, anyway so there's really well there's some things going on there in chapters 12 13 and uh, I just I just think skipping over to chapter 14 is a, a better thing to do so last week or the last yeah last week we looked at Joshua a man used by God and today I want to look at Caleb and he's probably one of my favorite Bible characters is Caleb. And, and a, I picture him as a little short guy, old, and uh, quite a fighter. He reminds me one time I was watching a television program, uh, oh, moving on up, and I can't even think of the name of the program now, but with the black guy. And uh, he somebody made him upset, and so one of his friends was sitting there holding on to him, and he was still trying to kick this guy that had made him upset. And uh, I see... Caleb is kind of that way, a, a scrapper, one who uh, digs in, and and, uh, and we'll see some of that as we go along here. But anyway, uh, just in in uh, mention, mentioning in, in, again from Joshua chapter 13, just uh, three things that I had listed down here. Joshua was old, and there was still a lot of land to be taken by the Israelites. And the children of Israel didn't drive out all the people as they were told to do. They left some of them. And the tribe of Levi didn't get any land. Uh, God had given all the other tribes land, but the tribe of Levi didn't get any land. Those are just some of the things that are happening there in, in chapter 13. So how is, Joshua, how is Caleb a man of God? At one time... Uh, at this time of our story, he was the oldest living, uh, as far as the Israelites were concerned, the oldest living person at that time. Uh, remember when they went into the land, twenty everybody 20 years old and younger, die, or older, I mean, died when they went to the land, except for Joshua and Caleb. And so he was the oldest living Israelite by 20 years. So what made Caleb a man of God, and what are some requirements for being so first of all I had the requirement in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 14 verses 6 through 8 and these are ones that uh, Diana basically read for us this morning but uh, I see Caleb displayed obedience in the first part of uh, verse 6 and 7 there and the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. And if you remember, that's going back to when they were went in to spy out the land. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. So he was one of the 12, uh, Caleb was one of the 12 that went into the promised land to spy it out. And if you remember the story, they came back, 10 said, we can't do it. It's impossible. These guys are just too big for us. They're giants, and we can't take the land. And Caleb and Joshua came back with a different report. Even though there were giants in the land, with God's help, they would be able to take that land. Well, the ten outruled the, the two, and as a result of that, they did not go into the promised land when, when they were supposed to. And as a result of that, then, too, uh, they wandered around in the wilderness. And everybody over the over. 20 years old, died there in the wilderness, and they weren't able to go into the promised land until all of those who were in that uh, age bracket had died off, and then they were able to get into the promised land. But Caleb displayed obedience. You might think, or you might not think this quality is so important, but Caleb and God both did. And again, we just mentioned that 45 years earlier, God had picked out Moses and, and uh, Moses. Joshua and Caleb to go into that promised land along with the other ones and uh, bring back that report whether they could do it or not. 
Caleb was obedient to his master, which, by the way, wasn't Moses. His master wasn't Moses. His master was God, and that's who, who uh, Caleb had for his master. And what a master to have. One main thing that a master wants from his servant, what would you say is one main thing that a master wants for his servant? I would say obedience. You know, a master wants for his, his servant to be obedient. And God's word, I believe, is very clear on this over in 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, verses 22, verse 22. Probably all familiar with it. I think most of us have at least an idea what's there. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. And so what God is looking for in the lives of these people here was obedience. Don't you think he's still looking for that in us? People who are willing to obey him, want to obey him, uh, even if the road is tough or the road is not tough, he still wants us to be obedient to him. And we can say whatever we want uh, about obedience, but uh, it's really important in the life of any believer. And Caleb, I believe, was obedient and proved, and it proved beneficial for him and his family. You know, as parents, we obey. I mean, we appreciate those, our kids, when we ask them to do something and they obey. I was thinking of the story in the Bible where the guy wanted his two sons to go out into the field to work, and the one says, yeah, I'll go, and didn't. And the other one said, no, I won't go, and then did. And, of course, the one that was obedient and did eventually go, uh, even though he said he wasn't going to, was the one that was blessed in that situation. But as God's children, why should we be blessed when we disobey? Our old sin nature doesn't want us to obey. Our old sin nature wants us to do our own thing and, and uh, be disobedient, if I can say it that way, and don't listen to what God has to say to us. Do it feels good. Wasn't that a popular saying back in the probably the 70s? Whatever feels good, do it. And, you know, as a result of that, uh, we're going to get in trouble when we do that. But Caleb was one who displayed obedience. How often did Jesus say, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And, I, you know, these truths that were good for them back there are still as important in the, for us today, too. If we love him, keep his commandments. And his commandments aren't hard to do, he says. His commandments are, are not that difficult to keep. In fact, uh, basically only two commandments. You say, well, there's ten, I thought. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus gives us two, and that's to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. Don't you think we'd have a different world if people did that today? You know, if we love God the way and our neighbor the way God wants us to? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we would have a different world. But Caleb, one of the requirements was obedience, and Caleb certainly displayed that. And Caleb displayed honesty in the last part of verse 7 and verse 8. First part of verse 8, it says, And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. He brought back an accurate report from what they saw based upon what God, with God on their side. If God be for us, what does the Bible say? Who can be against us? If God's on our side, who can be against us? And this is the way Caleb and Joshua felt. We're a lot smaller than those people, and we're not as many in number, and, and it would be a difficult thing in our own strength. We couldn't do it. And this is the way the ten looked at it. But with God on their side, uh, all they needed was one. In fact, they didn't even need one. How many times do we read in Scripture where God said, okay, you just sit by and watch and listen, and I'll take care of things for you. Uh, one particular night, he slew a, the angel of the Lord slew 185,000, I think it was. And the Israelites didn't have to do a thing. God did it all for them and numerous times. And not only just uh, one time, they had, people didn't want to move, and so God sent a, a swarm of hornets 
in there. You know, it's amazing how fast people can run when you got a swarm of hornets chasing you. And uh, they, that's what happened. The Israelites didn't have to do anything. So God is capable and didn't really even need the, the army and these different things. Uh, well, remember Jericho? What happened there? What did the Israelites do uh, at Jericho? Really nothing in essence. They walked around the city six times, and then on the seventh day they walked around it seven times, blew the horns and shouted, and the walls fell down. Uh, they really didn't do anything, but God did that for them. And, and uh, just so many different ways in which God worked on their behalf, and, and in essence, really, they didn't have to do anything. Uh, we might say, God doesn't need us, but we definitely need him for sure. And uh, while God wants to use us in different ways, there's no doubt about that. Uh, he, if we're not going to do it, if we're not going to be obedient, he can get along without us. But the best thing for us to do is be obedient and then we'll just watch him work in different ways in our life. Caleb was honest. Uh, he displayed that honesty. He brought back a good report. And let's just look at their mission and their report over in Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, verse 17 through 20 and 25 through 30. Numbers 13, starting with verse 17, says, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way in the so into the south and go up to the mountains and, and see what the land is like whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like the camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests uh, there, there or not, be of good courage and bring back some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was uh, the season of the first uh, ripe grapes and then jumping down to verse 25 says and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days now when they departed and came back to Moses uh, and when they came back to Moses and Aaron all of the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh they brought back word to them and all of the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land then they told him and said we want to, we, went, we went to the land where you sent us, and truly, uh, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Able to overcome it. With God's help, there was no reason why they couldn't do it. In their own strength, obviously, they couldn't. But it was an honest report. The people were big. And uh, the cities were well fortified, and they were basically outnumbered. But uh, they gave a gave an honest report, and on the other, and on as a result of that, uh, well, God blessed them, but He didn't bless the the people of of Israel because they refused to go. It's interesting to me too, as when they when God says, "Okay, I'm gonna you're gonna wander around the wilderness for 40 years," they say, "Oh, we'll go, we'll go," and God said, "It's too late." Now, you've already said you're not going to go, and so you're going to wander around one year for every uh, day that the children, that the, the ten spy, 12 spies were up in there. They were going to have to wander around one day for every day, and that's why the 40 years. You know, the story might not seem like much, but Honest played a big part in Caleb's life, and he was going to tell it like it was. Probably one of the main things that people look at in the life of a person and their character is, are they an honest person? That's what, that's what we want to see, don't we? If we look at the life of a person, we want to see whether they're really honest or not honest. And obviously a dishonest person can't be trusted, but uh, an honest person can. And I suspect that none of us appreciate very much a dishonest 
person. And if we don't, certainly God doesn't appreciate a dishonest person either. If we're going to please God in our daily living, we need to be honest. Because Caleb met these requirements, God rewarded him. And that's the second thing in verses 10 through 12, back over in Joshua chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. It says, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke his word to Moses, while, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day when that Moses sent sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and coming in. Uh, now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with you, uh, be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. So we see him as the reward that uh, God blessed him as a result of that. He had a long life, 85 years old. Most of us haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, in fact, most of us haven't gotten too awfully close. Uh, Don's the closest, and he got a year closer just last, last week. But anyway... Uh, there were three ways, of many ways, in which he was rewarded. The long life one, of course. And it seems to me like that's a pretty good reward for obedience, isn't it? To obey God and to and to have long life as a result of obedience is a, is a real reward. None of us here, of course, are quite that old except for Don, and he comes as close as any of us, but uh, we're working on it. And uh, some of you are closer than others. But there's a reward, I think, uh, Another reward I think that's very interesting, and that was Caleb was strong. We see that in verses 11, uh, verse 11. Most guys like to think of this, this of themselves when they get older, but for Caleb, Caleb, it was true. He says, I'm as strong now as I was when I was 45, and, uh, or 40, 40 years old. I'm just as strong now. As, you know, it kind of reminded me of a Jack LaLanne for, of today. You know who Jack LaLanne was? Probably most of you do. A guy that could still do push-ups and chin-ups and uh, all kinds of things when he was well up in years. Uh, I don't know for some reason. I just I just see that picture of uh, Caleb in Jack Lalane and the and the physical fitness that he had. Uh, is that a blessing or not to be able to be that str that strong? I think Jack. I think uh, Caleb would have given Jack Lalane a run for his money if. Jack and Orlean were still alive and Caleb were still alive. But um, I don't know if he ate his Wheaties or ate his Cheerios, uh, Caleb. But whatever it was, uh, God used that to help him to, uh, pardon me? He ate kosher. Kosher, okay. Yeah, yeah, otherwise he'd be in trouble, wouldn't he? So, uh, you know, but God used those different things to... to and he wasn't, he wasn't lying. He was telling the truth, I believe. And we'll see just in, in a minute here uh, that he was, he was obviously that he was strong. He was confident that he was fit for battle. He said, I'm just as, as fit now as I was back then. Again, verse 12 says, Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spake in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there. You know who the Anakim were? They were giants, huge people, uh, Goliath fit into that category. He was, what, nine foot six or taller, some people say, uh, fit into that category. This is what was on that mountain that Caleb wanted to get. And he said, let me have that mountain. Out of all the places, he could have said, let me have the lowlands with all the good things going on and, and the people weren't like giants. Uh, but a little feisty guy wanted to get right in there and mix it up with the biggest of them. And, and as a result of that, God let him have that mountain that he wanted. Uh, I see in verse 12, too, that he was fearless. He wasn't afraid. How many times does God's word tell us to not be afraid? Uh, fear not I'm with you and all these different promises that God has given to us. Caleb knew that God was on his side, so why waste time being afraid? He was more than able, with God's help, to go in and take that land. Isaiah 41.10 41, says, 
Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And, you know, I believe that these were some of the promises, even though Caleb didn't have that down in writing. These were some of the promises that God had given to Caleb that uh, he was with him and more than able and willing to help. You know, fear is probably the one major thing that keeps people from doing many of the things uh, that God wants them to do, including becoming a Christian. You know, if I become a Christian, what will happen? You know, I won't be able to do this, I won't be able to do that, and I'll have this problems and that. And, and a fear, Satan uses fear, I believe, as a major uh, thing in our lives to keep us from doing so much. Have you ever been afraid of doing anything? You know, God says, I want you to do this, and, and you know, fear steps in, and as a result of that, you, you don't step out and do it. Uh, it's either fear or faith, and we need to walk by faith, not by sight, and not let fear uh, interfere with us. But God was with Caleb, and that's how I see Caleb, that God was his salvation, and he didn't have to be afraid. He didn't have to wonder. He didn't, well, maybe, I don't, I don't know. You know, this might be a... a rather difficult situation but it wasn't because of who he was that he was fearless but because of who God is and the fact that God was on his side you know some people without God are not afraid of anything you know they're, they're not afraid to tackle whatever or do this or do that whatever but uh, Caleb knew with God on his side that uh, he didn't have to worry he didn't have to be afraid you know, I was thinking of the disciples when they were in their in their boat. You remember when the water came up and the and the sea out in the sea, and how they were all afraid. And Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat, and they woke him up and said, well, "Don't you care that we're going to die? We're all out here, and, and the waves are coming over in the boat." And Jesus, of course, spoke to the water, and the water stopped and and calmed down. But the, even his own disciples were afraid, in many cases, and. Oh, it must have been frustrating for Jesus to work with these 12 guys that uh, just didn't seem to get it. Eventually they did, of course, but uh, Caleb was one of the guys that was basically, in my opinion, fearless. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, my strength, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Boy, if we have that as a, as a priority in our lives, we don't have to worry about anything, do we? We don't have to be afraid of anything. And Satan keeps bringing these so-called fears into our mind, and as we think about them, they get bigger and bigger and harder and harder. And like Joshua, I mean like a Caleb, you know, wasn't afraid. And the psalmist says, who do we need to be afraid of? We don't need to be afraid of anybody. Uh, God was on his side. Romans 8, 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And Martin Luther once said, One with God is a majority. And it's really true, isn't it? If God's on our side, we don't have to fear anything. It doesn't matter what it is. And uh, even though it may look like we have to fear, we don't have to fear. Isn't that what we have seen so far throughout the book of Joshua, just the fact that you don't have to be afraid. He started over here in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It says, The book of the law shall not, uh, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do those things that is written in it. For then you will have make your way prosperous, and you will have great success. Uh, wasn't exactly the verse I was looking for. Verse eight, okay. Verse eight, verse nine says, "Have I, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go." And it's 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 true. He's there with us. We don't have to be afraid of what Satan would throw there at us. God allowed Caleb. To be all that he was, obedient, honest, strong, fearless, and lived a long life. And in the reason, verses 13 and 14, or verses 9 and 13 and 14, go back to verse 9 again. It says, So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot 
has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And in verses 13 and 14, And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, uh, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. The reason he was blessed, the reason he was able to do all these things was because he wholly followed the Lord his God. And I believe that gives us the secret to his success. As we walk with God and do what God wants us to do, God's going to bless us for it. He's given us that promise. The uh, our, uh, When we were going to Bible school, the juniors had to come up with a motto for the seniors. And the motto that our, that junior class that we were in came up with was, Holy follow thy God. And they had a, a cross. I, I've got it here in the church someplace. A cross and then a, a, has a path going up to going up to the cross. But holy follow the God. This is what Josh, or Caleb said that he did. He wholly followed the God. His goal in life was to be and do all that God wanted him to be and to do. Is that a pretty good goal? You know, I wish all of us had that kind of a goal. that We just want to be and do what God wants us to do, whatever that might be. And in this particular case, God honored Caleb for his willingness to be that kind of a person. And as a result, uh, blessed them with, with numerous different things. J. Vernon McGee says, The most important thing in this life is to wholly follow the Lord. Matthew Henry says, Those that follow God fully when they are young shall have both the credit and comfort of it when they are old, and the reward of it forever in the heavenly canon. <clears throat> to follow, wholly follow God is doesn't happen by accident. It takes work. We have to work at it if we're going to be and do what God wants us to be. Uh, it takes the grace of God, too, and God and the determination. So, what's your plan for conquering your mountain? Do you have a mountain? It can be anything, can it? A different, all kinds of things can be our mountain that uh, we face. And, and what's our plan for conquering it? Caleb had the plan, and God honored his plan, and that was to be all that God wanted him to be, and mostly the plan was just simply to wholly follow God, the Lord is God, and as a result of that, he was blessed. I hope that's true of us as we face different mountains. It might be a little hill, or it could be a major mountain, whatever. Uh, different things come up in our lives, don't they, don't they, from time to time, and how do we deal with them? Do we attack them and hope for the best or do we seek God's help in meeting that need that we have I suggest that we choose God uh, choose to wholly follow God and when the fiery darts of Satan come at us we have a shield there then that can protect us from those fiery darts is it possible to have that shield I believe it is and Paul gives us that answer over in First Peter how we can be holy follow our God over in first Peter chapter one verses thirteen through sixteen. First Peter one verses thirteen through sixteen. It says therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your con conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And in Philippians 4.8, uh, adds on to this, I believe. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are uh, of good report, if there be any, if there is any virtue and any praise, and if there any anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So, what do we think about? What we do? How we respond? Uh, all makes a big difference in our lives. So now that you know how to follow God, holy follow your God. Uh, 
you going to do it? Are you going to try to do it? And again, we can't do it in our own strength. We have to have God's help to do it. But I, I propose that we, we seek to do that as best we can to follow the Lord our God. Holy follow Him. And it's a decision that only you can make. I, I wish we could make it for each other, but it's a decision that each one of us has to make for ourselves. I, I trust this morning that, like Caleb, you say, I want to be, I want to be a little Caleb. I may not be that old, but I may not be that physically strong. But what's more important, physical strength or spiritual strength? You know, obviously, spiritual strength is far better than physical, isn't it? And I, you know, I just. Uh, good friend of mine died uh, Friday morning and I was sharing with her husband you know that our old body this tense fading away and uh, getting weaker and weaker and, and uh, more difficult but the inner man is being renewed day by day as well too and that's what really counts isn't it to be renewed inwardly rather than uh, outwardly not that there's anything wrong with being renewed out outwardly as well too but uh, Boy, to be to be renewed inwardly. I, I pray that for all of us. I pray that we would allow God to work in our lives in such a way that uh, we're renewed day by day inwardly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for stories like Caleb, guys who are willing to to do what you want us want them to do, what you want us to do. I pray that we'd be like Caleb and wholly follow the Lord our God and to, to make that a priority in our lives. Not something that we just do on a Sunday morning for an hour and and uh, let it go the rest of the week, but that it's a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week thing that we we desire to walk and talk with you, and as a result of that, be blessed in so many different ways. And when we go through the struggles and trials of life, you're there with us, and the mountains that we face, uh, you can take care of those as well too, just like you did with Caleb. So. Thank you for these different things, and just help it help that to be the prayer of our hearts, that we be what you'd want us to be, and to wholly follow you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.